Hi, my name is Tony McLaughlin, and I'm talking payments with Zenon Capron from Capron Asia. Zenon, uh, great to uh, have you joining us today. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks for having me, Tony. Hey, Zenon, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do? Sure. So actually, my background is uh, I started off my career at City, so very uh, have a soft spot in my heart for the company. Um, started off with City in New York, uh, worked for the company for five years altogether in a variety of technology roles, uh, culminating in being the uh, head of technology for City Group in Portugal. Um, I left the bank in 2004, went back to do my MBA, and then came out to Asia and more specifically China in 2004, where I was working for Intel, uh, so looking after sales and marketing for Intel in the financial vertical. And then after a couple of years of doing that, I left and set up Capronasia. And really our focus is helping companies understand the market trends and the evolution of financial services across payments, banking, capital markets in Asia. Uh, so I'm based in Singapore now, and we have a team in uh, Shanghai as well as Seoul and Taipei. So Zena, your, your clients are banks and fintechs, merchants. What, who, do you, who do you typically work with? Pretty much anybody in the ecosystem. So uh, we certainly have financial institutions, banks as clients, uh, a lot of the large vendors. Uh, so we do work, public work with Finastra, FIS, a lot of the infrastructure players, uh, as well as kind of the third parties uh, within the ecosystem. So the MasterCards and Visas within the payment space as well. Yeah. So you've caught, you've caught the wave of Asian fintech. I mean, it's good timing on your part, right, to be in the right place at the right time uh, in advance of such a massive boom. Yeah, I mean, getting to China in 2004 and thinking about how that changed over the 14 years that I was living there is just incredible. Um, you know, I, I, I remember when I first moved to China, I would pay my rent by going to my bank. Um, and because I couldn't pull out, not that my rent was that much, it was just over $1,000, but I couldn't pull out more than the equivalent of $500 out of the ATM. So I'd have to go to the teller. Uh, put my money into a paper bag, walk it across the street and deposit it in my landlord's bank account. And that was the first, uh, my first use of mobile money, except it's very far from where we are today. And when I left in 2018, you know, I was paying my staff using one wallet. I was uh, buying investment products from another fintech and all these players that are very non-traditional uh, providers of financial products and services. So to see that transition in, in a, such a cash heavy society like China is just amazing. Uh, over the time. Yeah, absolutely. And that, uh, you know, the wallets, the spread of wallets has now gone into most of uh, Asia, right? So almost every country in Asia has a mass market uh, wallet provided by, uh, you call it a fintech or a big tech. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in, in China, you know, kind of the birth of mobile payments or at least mobile payments on a mass scale, uh, there's a couple of companies that run about you know 90% of the market there. But in a lot of the other markets, like in Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, you have tens of wallets uh, that are addressing this. And really, we're going through this period of amazing uh, payment infrastructure innovation. I mean, if you look at pretty much all the individual countries around Asia, most of them domestically have gone to real-time payment platforms. And one of the first things they layer on top of that is, is retail payments. Uh, so here in Singapore, we have the fast uh, payments infrastructure that's the domestic real time, and they've layered this pay now uh, QR code acceptance on top of that. So it's made a very a big change, especially on the retail side. So when you talk about these digital wallets, you know the use of QR codes. It's a very it's a very unique solution to to a challenging problem. Uh, you know, a QR code. All you need is a phone or some kind of smart device with a 3.2 megapixel camera, and and you're in business either as a merchant or as a consumer. And it, it's it's had a huge impact on how how commerce is done all across the region. Yeah, it's super interesting because QR codes, I guess, solve that uh, acceptance problem. You know, because not every merchant would have had the ability to have a a, a point of sale reader. And so a simple QR code, even a static QR code, enables uh, the most basic of merchants to accept pay, uh, digital payments, right? Yeah, true. And, and the original challenge in China around QR codes was that when these leaders in mobile payments were, were trying to get their payment system set up, uh, if you had an NFC phone, which would be the technology behind Apple Pay or uh, Samsung Pay and some of those platforms, the, uh, you had to have an NFC SIM to match up with that. So if you were in China, that would mean that you would have to partner with one of the large telcos, and that was very challenging. Uh, whereas QR codes, for the most part, are completely software 
based. They're hardware independent. They run on Android, Apple, uh, even UNOS, which is Alibaba's platform. So it's very cheap. Um, and then if you picture yourself being, a, you know, one of the Kiranas in Indonesia, so those are the the very, the oh, sorry, in India, those are the very small mom and pop stores where maybe only a couple of people selling food or, uh, you know, household daily needs. You're not going to have a, a point of sale terminal and complicated hardware, but you may have a smartphone. And so if you have a smartphone, all of a sudden you can start accepting digital payments and be onboarded very quickly. So it's a very secure, uh, hardware agnostic, um, ubiquitous platform that, yeah, that sure. has, has been very useful. So look, wait, this is a kind of heady mix and a rapid development of in, enablers for digital payments. As you said, we have the the fintech and the big tech wallets. We have these enormous e-commerce websites that are becoming more, more popular, which in, in a sense, I guess the, um, you know, Alipay, for example, has become so popular because Alibaba was so popular and WeChat Pay because WeChat was so popular and in Singapore, Grab uh, Pay because Grab became so popular. Um, and then you have the instant payments. I think you have the beginnings of, of open banking in some of the Asian markets as well. Mm. And now on top, um, the development, the initial development of, of some central bank digital currencies, in particular the, the China case. Now you uh, recently wrote a, an article in Forbes, which was uh, very well written about how the Chinese central bank digital currency you see coexisting with the other layers of the digital payment infrastructure. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the primary thing I was writing about in that article was the fact that a lot of media looks at it being a zero-sum game. Um, so the Chinese government putting in place this central bank digital currency to offset the market power of the incumbent players, some of which you mentioned before. Really, we don't see it that way. I mean, the, these large players have had a history of cooperating with the government on both payment and non-payment related um, activities. I mean, if you look at everything that's happened in COVID-19, mm -hmm. uh, when China was in lockdown, these big tech players in China were critical for China keeping the economy going as best it could, as well as providing individuals with the food and, and basic necessities that they need. So there's really a symbiotic relationship there. And there was a lot of talk that the government was developing this central bank digital currency to kind of push out that control. And it's true. I mean, between the two large players, they have 90% of the market. So that's it's quite a large market share. But if you look, you know, in the credit card space, you could say the same thing about some of the large credit, the global credit card players that dominate the market as well. So really, we see it being a collaborative effort. And in all likelihood, some of those tech companies were involved with the government in, in developing the uh, DCEP, what they call it there in um, China, digital currency, electronic payment uh, platform. So it's more, it, it's not replacing, it will just supplant what's already there. Yeah, there, there's a lot of discussion about what it actually means. And um, there are some uh, people who think it's really about the internationalization of the renminbi, um, whereas my observation of it initially is it's, it's more about perhaps uh, providing an additional domestic rail. So could you comment up upon that? Is this a, a domestic play, an international play, or both? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a good point. I, I, we really see it as both. I mean, China has been on real-time payments for, for a number of years now. The, the domestic payment infrastructure is, is reasonably good. And a couple of years ago, they set up a clearing platform for digital payments as well as and all the digital payments are, are sent through that. I think the domestic argument for the central bank digital currency that they're working on is for more uh, ability to monitor what's happening with, with money. Um, as an example, I mean, a lot of the commercial banks, uh, most of their clients tend to be the large state-owned enterprises. And so rather than lend to small, medium enterprises for a number of years when the interest rates were fixed, you could lend to Zenon at 7% or you could lend to PetroChina at 6.5%. Well, mm -hmm. you're probably going to lend to PetroChina because you'll get a little bit less return, but it's too big to fail and you'll get your money back for sure. So so a lot of the retail and SMEs were, were starved of cash. Now, the government has implemented several programs where kind of they're pushing money towards the SMEs, but they have very little control about how the commercial banks actually use those loans. So an example that was presented to me was if the government has earmarked, say, the equivalent of, of $100,000 for an SME loan, and the commercial banks 
decide to give it to a state-owned enterprise, they wouldn't be able to, the money wouldn't be activated uh, because it didn't actually get to the intended recipient. It's going to the state-owned enterprise instead of the SME. So it, it gives the government a little bit more control in terms of how the money is used. Um, and then obviously, you know, being the fact that it's a capital controlled currency, there's, there's concerns about um, the cross-border aspect of that because, you know, the, the cash is very fungible, whereas the digital currency will have a little bit more control over. But I think it's interesting what you mentioned about the internationalization. I I mean, that's something that since I got to China, China had been focused on. Um, and, you know, probably up until 2010, there was a strong push to internationalize the renminbi. And then they kind of took the gas off a little bit because they didn't really have a good method of doing that. You know, people were just so used to using the U.S. dollar or one of the other reserve currencies. So I think with the Belt and Road, uh, you know, that was China's kind of first push for kind of geopolitical kind of soft power influence uh, throughout its throughout the, the, the Belt and Road initiative of countries. And then potentially on the back of that, you could potentially see this central bank digital currency shoring that up. And, you know, if you think about how that's implemented there in London, you have uh, one of the offshore renminbi clearing centers, Hong Kong, Toronto, you have these centers where you would have to work with the banks if you wanted to open up a renminbi account and actually accept renminbi. In theory, if, if, if it worked um, more openly, you could just download the DCEP wallet onto your phone and all of a sudden be up and running with renminbi. So if you're a a contractor in Kenya and you want to be paid and renminbi instead, you would have that option. And so that would kind of expand internationalization a little bit, but uh, still challenges beyond, I think, just the digital yeah. currency on that aspect. Yeah, I think that's uh, that, that may be possible if the instrument was essentially a, a better instrument, you know, if it was essentially mm. like a tokenized um, renminbi. Uh, but Digital bearer instruments, I think, have got some problems, and in particular, the problem of key management. Like if that worker who downloaded the digital renminbi into their mobile phone and then lost their mobile phone, um, mm. if there's not a way of recovering that, you know, that key, that private key, then the the just like you know, a lot of Bitcoin is lost because the keys are lost and can't be recovered. So, um, I think yes, you could have. Uh, a, a great commerce in a digital renminbi if it was a better instrument, but a digital better instrument would be very hard to manage from a capital controls perspective and also from a key management perspective if, if it's a better instrument. So I think it's, yeah. I think it remains to be seen whether it's a domestic play or an international play. Um, but one thing I did want to ask you about the potential rise of the uh, central bank digital currencies is, do you think it it may um, foster innovation or or damp down innovation, and I'm thinking about all of the innovations that we've seen in, um, you know, in, in India and Singapore and Indonesia with all the development of these essentially e-money wallets. And I'm just imagining if the government, if a government had said, "Hey, we're going to provide essentially an e-money wallet to all citizens." which is backed by the full faith and credit of the, of the government, why would a private sector player step into that space? So I guess my question is, is central bank digital currency good or bad for innovation? Yeah, that's a really good question. I, I think, you know, the government's role in fintech in general really varies around the world and you mentioned open banking as an example i mean you have a lot of really good examples across asia of where it's either regulatory driven or private sector driven and it's kind of unclear um which which is the correct answer around that uh, you know i think a lot of the hype around open banking sure so uh, somebody was giving me the example i move money to my brokerage account and my broker can tell me immediately when it arrives because they have an api that ties into the balance checking function Okay, great. I mean, there's, there's kind of a, a basic level of infrastructure that you can provide across these. But I, I think domestically, it's challenging in Southeast Asia in, in, in terms of the basic financial infrastructure. I mean, your payments player coming into one of these markets, again, you have to compete with very cheap, effective um, uh, domestic infrastructure. You know, if you were going to do a digital wallet here in Singapore, you know, you, the pay now infrastructure, it's free for retail to retail or retail to business yes. transactions. So how you compete with that is challenging. And I think that's something that Grab is really struggling with is, you know, we constantly see, there was another article that I wrote, I guess, late last year about the rewards program on Grab. And 
they were just subsidizing to, to the tune of about 6% a couple of years ago, all of the transactions. And that's dropped to about 1.5% over the course of four years because it's just very expensive to do customer acquisition. Now, in China, those guys have already you know, captured that 90% of the market. So it's, it's easier for them to you know, stop the incentives and just build on what they have with other products and services. But I, I think the challenge is, is it's not so much the government, but it's it's within what is there. How do you actually make money? Um, and and for for a lot of these fintechs, and especially especially now during this COVID period, some are doing very well, but some are struggling. You know, yeah. the, the idea of raising capital and doing a constant capital raise here is very challenging. So they may face difficult times around that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, but I guess that's the operation of the market, right? It's like, you know private investors raising uh, raising money. Uh, taking a punt at something, some win, some fail. That's the the market. Yeah. Mechanism. I just wonder, in the payment space, whether that market mechanism may be, you know, the calculation of the entrepreneurs might be slightly different. If uh, if the government says that they are going to provide a a, a universal uh, digital payment mechanism through a central bank digital currency, I guess it's an open. Well, I- yeah, yeah, and I think I mean a lot of the innovation that we're seeing is what you can do on top of payments. Um, so the things you can do around standards like ISO twenty o two two, you know, the the extra data that you can carry with that, or uh, you know, in uh, using the Grab example again, Grab likes to call themselves a super app. In my mind, you know, on the consumer side, it's not really, but on the merchant side or the driver side of the equation, it kind of is because, you know, that person has the app open all of the time on their phone. So you have a lot more alternative data that you can use to score that person's credit and, and provide them credit. Absolutely. So I think, you know, the, the, the payments provide the basic level of infrastructure. And we're seeing the same thing in China, right? I mean, the, the, the merchant fees are 60 basis points for the average mobile transaction in, in China. So it's much less than cards. Uh, in other markets and cards have come down in China as well. So, you know, the fees around payments aren't really the revenue source anymore. It's, it's the lending that you can do on top of that. It's the wealth management products that you can do on top of that that are, that are really, I think, where the innovation is to a certain extent. Uh, uh, absolutely. And so that kind of leads to my, uh, you know, my final question, which is, you know, in, also in, in Asia, you really see this picture emerging of, you know, who, who's going to win in financial services? Is it, is it going to be the banks, the big tech or the fintech? I guess in the, in the, China, in the China example, um, the, the providers of financial services into digital platforms are the big tech providers of the platforms. That's not so much the case in other parts of the world where you have a very thriving, if you like, fintech ecosystem who are providing these financial services and plugging mm. into different platforms. And only the beginning of banks publishing APIs to, pu- pu- to plug into platforms. That's only at the very early stages. So do you, what do you see as being the, I feel like the emerging model? Who's going to win this race to embed financial services? Will it be the big techs themselves? Will it be the scrappy fintechs? Or do, do banks have any chance of getting their acts together and being that lender on the digital platform? So who's going to win, big tech, fintech, or banks? Yeah, I'll, I'll use two examples. Uh, one, one is b- back to China. I mean, a number of years ago, the Chinese regulators basically went to the large and fintech players and said, look, you guys are getting too big. If you continue to grow at this size, we're going to regulate you like a bank. And the, not even banks want to be regulated like banks, right? It, the, <laughs> the cost of compliance is so high on that. So they, they pulled back from actually providing the financial services, but provided the technology. So now if you get a loan on one of the virtual bank platforms in China that's provided by a technology company, they will provide the channel and distribution, but the underlying asset will be financed by a traditional bank. And so we're seeing this kind of cooperation uh, between the fintechs and the banks that is really something that I, I wouldn't have even predicted five years ago, that, um, but it's really they're playing to their strengths because the technology companies are good at distribution and they've got the CX, the customer experience, down pat in their apps. Uh, whereas the banks provide the balance sheet and uh, the trust on the back end. The other example is here in Singapore, and, and somebody brought this to my attention. You know, at one point, 
Singtel, the, the, the large mobile provider here or telephone provider and infrastructure provider here in Singapore owned all of the infrastructure. So basically owned all the cables. And eventually the government took that over. And so now the government essentially leases it out to um, the, the, the few telcos that we have here and then they lease it out to other uh, virtual networks on top of that. And it's interesting because then the infrastructure actually becomes a utility that everybody uses. And, and somebody actually from a regulator had, had mentioned to that, you know, you have this idea that banks are meant to be profitable and meant to be uh, these growing entities. But what if they really are just the infrastructure providers and then, you know, all of these other value added services, you know, maybe the government takes over the basic accounting around bank accounts and then everybody else is kind of tying into that almost using the API example. So, I mean, if we look at what's happened in telecommunications, there might be some examples of, you know, where the industry is going in the future. But certainly, I mean, when we look at the big markets, this cooperation is 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 really growing. And I think that um, that might be the future for Asia anyways. Yeah. Well, again, Zanon, you've certainly caught the wave of massive uh, payment and fintech innovation in Asia. And uh, I always enjoy reading your articles. I can't help but notice that both of us have positioned ourselves in front of a bookshelf uh, to make ourselves look slightly more intelligent than we actually are. Um, any any books that you could recommend from that shelf? Is that your Dr. Seuss collection behind you? Yeah, it's actually the Dr. Seuss collection. I, I have to say that, uh, you know, I do have a small child, so that's my excuse for that. <laughs> um, there's a de Tocqueville book called Democracy in America. And um, I think, you know, with everything that's been happening over the past uh, couple of years, I may have to reread that and see if that's, uh, if you had some of those things right or some of those things wrong about what's happening in some of our democracies around the world. Yeah, well, actually behind me, this is just a Zoom background. Uh, you yeah. know, so make yourself look smart, Zoom background. That's, that's my, I can't recommend any of these books. I haven't read any of them. Yeah, there was a, 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 on a Zoom call I had last week, somebody said, Zenon, you can't afford a yacht in real life and you can't even afford the yacht background on your Zoom. <laughs> well, Zenon, thanks very much for talking to us today. today. It's been uh, educational as always. Um, have a great day. Thanks very much. Thanks, Tony. Great to chat. You too.